Here we go. Good morning, everyone. I'm Liz Jennings, Employer Engagement Specialist with CareerForce. We will begin in uh, one or two minutes. Um, as you're waiting, I've, I've posted a, a forms, uh, attendance form link in the Q&A. Would you please uh, enter in your first name, last name, zip code, and I've got one question or one or two questions about what you're looking for. Um, I use that information only behind the scenes to mark you as attended in Minnesota Works if you are a job seeker. And if you're one of my workforce colleagues within Minnesota, I just like to know that you're call and we can touch base later. So please fill out that while we wait. Meanwhile, you can, uh, if you need closed captioning, you can press the CC button. I believe it's on the bottom of your screen. And then I've enabled a couple of different languages. Choose the language if, if it's appropriate for you. Um, and you know, as always, you can type questions in the Q&A. If the attendance form doesn't work for you for some reason, uh, feel free to put your name in the Q&A area and then I'll keep that behind the scenes. I won't make that public, but include your zip code too, just so I have the, the right location for the right person. So we'll begin in one minute. I'll give you a chance to do that. Okay, it's 10.01, so welcome to Career Forces Virtual Career Fair, special edition on Wednesday, September 30th, simply because I usually do these on Monday. So we've switched the day this week, but we are so glad to have you here today. Um, before we get started completely, just a couple of reminders. You can ask questions by typing in a question in the Q&A area. You can turn on subtitles in English, Spanish, Arabic, or a couple of other languages by clicking on the CC button on the bottom of the screen and then going to the gear wheel and choosing the language. And also, if you would please, um, anyone who's listening right now, fill in the attendance form that I've posted in the Q&A area. That lets me know who you're, who are here. I mark you as attended if you are in the Minnesota Works uh, .NET job bank and all my workforce colleagues. I like to know that you've attended and we can chat later behind the scenes. Um, so at this point, I am just so pleased to say that we have Minnesota Department of Health in partnership with Rose International here today. We'll be hearing about all of the special uh, positions and projects that they're working on related to COVID. Um, efforts. So I would first like to welcome Chris Elfram from Minnesota's Department of Health. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. Thank you, Liz. Yes, uh, as Liz mentioned, my name is Chris Elfram, and since the middle of March, I have been working um, full time on our COVID-19 response. And just like many other health department employees and some other state agency employees, I've been reassigned to this position. As the as the pandemic began to unfold, we realized we certainly can't do it with our existing staff in their current position. So we reassigned hundreds of, of Minnesota Department of Health employees to help out in the response. And um, it's been interesting. It's been rewarding. It's been stressful at times. This is really work that, uh, you know, you can really see the results. We, we have made a difference. Our hospitalizations and deaths are down. We still have fairly high case counts, um, but you know we feel like we're doing the doing the right things. Uh, as the as the pandemic continued to evolve, we have realized we can't maintain this with just Minnesota Department of Health staff and in a few other re redeployed staff. So we engaged Rose International in the spring, and now have over 200 case investigators through Rose International, as well as a few other positions. But even then, we recognize that this is a um, long-term 
effort and we need to give some of our staff relief. We need to send them back to the important work they do in their other areas and simply just give them uh, some breathing room. So we're excited today to have you here and thank you for coming uh, to, to discuss these four positions that will really help in our response and hopefully uh, some of these are of interest to you and uh, in the future we may be able to uh, work together. So I'm going to turn this, I don't know, back to Liz and then to Beth. Well, just go ahead, Beth, and um, sure. just set the scene for us. Yeah, Absolutely. I'm going to turn it to Beth. Sorry, Beth. Oh. I just want to. Oops, sorry, Beth. I just want to say Beth has been working um, in our epidemiology area, another reassigned staff, and so she has done a great job and can tell you more about what uh, where our work has has been. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Liz. Liz, could you advance the slide, please? Great. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as Chris mentioned, my name is Beth Gilstrom. I am also a reassigned staff who has been working on COVID for a while. Um, to give you a little background on the Minnesota Department of Health, we are the state agency that has statutory responsibility uh, to ensure the health and safety of all Minnesotans. COVID-19 has really been an unprecedented event for us in terms of scope. I know Chris touched on this. You know, not only do we have MDH staff who are have been reassigned across the agency, it's really been a statewide effort to support all aspects of the response. We have been working very close, closely with our local public health and tribal public health partners. Uh, we've had volunteers from the University of Minnesota and some of our healthcare organizations. And I've also, as, as Chris mentioned, had a really nice partnership with Rose since this spring. Um, but we do have to return to our jobs, or some do, and the work of COVID really is not done yet. And so what we hope to really talk with you about today is some of the infrastructure support that we need to have in place to continue to support the work of case and contact investigation across the state. So Liz, if you could advance the slide, please. So our epidemiology and operations branch does quite a few different things. One of the thing, main functions of it is the case investigation contact tracing aspect, but underlying all of that are functions related to determining what data elements we collect, our processes, our procedures, monitoring for data quality. We do a lot of data analysis. We have special teams who follow up with some of our specific groups. We are a liaison to partners and community stakeholders. And really at the end of the day, all of this work and all of this data and information is intended to both help um, inform and educate our cases and our potential contacts, try to identify how someone has become infected, how they may be spreading, if they are a positive case, but also to collect important information that our policymakers use as they make recommendations for the state. So there's a lot of, you know, the case and contact, case investigators, contact tracers are often our outward facing folks who are really interacting with people and, and interacting with our cases and contacts, but there's this underlying infrastructure that has to be in place that's really important to support all of that work. Liz, if you could do the next slide, please. So with all of that in mind, as Chris mentioned, we have established a relationship with Rose International to really assist us with building our staff capacity to achieve our goals. And Rose is working with us to hire staff to fill a variety of roles that we need to continue a strong response to COVID-19 in Minnesota. And that's really what we hope to talk with you about today. So with that, um, Liz, you can advance us one more slide. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Hans de Bruun from Rose International to start getting into some of the specifics. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Liz. Thank you, Beth, Chris, um, for the opportunity to, uh, to meet the group here. Um, and uh, we'll go over a number of pages. Of course, fairly quickly, we will delve into the details of these particular roles. Um, with the assumption that uh, many of you may not really have heard of Rose International, that's that's a relatively normal concept. Uh, many people would, of course, know companies like uh, Manpower and Kelly Services. 
Ronstadt, they, they operate also in the staffing and talent uh, services industry. But uh, Rose has been around for uh, 27 years. We were founded in uh, 1993. Uh, we are a woman-owned diversity, uh, woman-owned, minority-owned diverse company. And uh, for all that time, we've been steadily working to uh, advance essentially our, uh, our success in the marketplace. And we currently rank somewhere in the top 25 to top 30 staffing companies in the United States. So while we may not be a known entity to uh, you know, the general public, uh, we certainly are uh, a very known entity in the staffing industry. Our focus is essentially on Fortune 500 companies and government agencies, uh, state government agencies. And uh, we are very pleased with our uh, recognition uh, on the Glassdoor best places to work list shown here. We are actually the only staffing company uh, that's uh, on this list in this industry. Uh, you'll see other very you know, well-known famous company names, of course, on that list. But so we pride ourselves uh, in, in how, we, how we approach uh, our workers, candidates, contractors, uh, everybody. So if you could advance to the next slide. Um, I am a regional vice president. I have been with Rose International for 13 years. The uh, two key people that uh, work with the MDH teams on a on a day to day basis and of course lead the Rose International teams are Amanda Ivanoff and Jeremy Dickman. Um, both have been uh, with Rose many years and have worked with us on large projects in the past. Uh, as uh, Chris and Beth, of course, uh, have already explained. This too is for us a totally unusual, uh, exceptional project and uh, we've really had to you know, uh, shift gears and learn a lot of new skills in a very short amount of time. And I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to be doing that with uh, Amanda and Jeremy. Next slide. I've covered some of this already, so I won't really go into the details, but uh, the main point here really that's, that's I think key is that uh, we do have a lot of experience in very high activity projects. We work with a very large retail company here in the Twin Cities uh, on what they call peak season. Uh, another company in the financial services industry that likes to talk about, you know, what's in your wallet. Um, we support them with very large projects. And so we were a very natural fit based on our experience uh, and, um, you know, uh, capability to make a lot happen in a short amount of time when all of this started to happen in the spring. For those of you who might be concerned or listening in in terms of how did Rose International become this player in this project, I can assure you uh, the state of Minnesota, of course, went through all of the uh, screening and procurement selection processes um, and um, uh, then uh, over the course of a number of steps and months, frankly, uh, engaged more and more with Rose International. Next slide, please. To just kind of round out, round out the profile of, you know, who is Rose International, uh, very important, I think, for this project and what makes us also a unique fit uh, for the work that's being done. As a woman-owned, minority-owned company, we automatically bring a very inclusive and diverse mindset to everything that we do. And so one of the things, specifically on the case investigation uh, staffing work that we've done, uh, was the significance of cultural understanding and languages. And so all of the key languages that play a role in the different um, ethnic communities uh, around the state, uh, we really serve that well by uh, bringing candidates and contractors into the project that you know were from those backgrounds, met all the criteria, spoke the language, because what's the point of trying to do accurate case investigation if you're having a hard time actually relating to the people that you're that you're talking to. So um, that's been a, a real highlight also of uh, how we've been able to put the project together is the, the diversity of the team and the language skills and the, the ethnic diversity. Next slide. So the way I would describe the why are we now where we are now uh, sort of question uh, ties back to what uh, Chris and Beth have been talking about. I heard the word infrastructure. 
Um, so thus far, and that's listed at the bottom of this particular slide, the, the focus is very much being on case investigation, as uh, the state uh, refers to it, um, uh, either with the focus on the general public, so that's the case investigation role, or focused on healthcare workers, where the facility infection control nurse role has also played, played a significant part. But we're now kind of at a fork in the road where the project is spidering into these additional roles so that this whole ongoing um, infrastructure is indeed um, in place. Next slide. I realize that it is very important for uh, all of you here on the call with an interest in these roles to know how you can get to us and communicate and share your background information. So at the top right, you see our uh, website URL and the link to the hot jobs page. You can also just get there by going to roseit.com. Um, you can also send emails and the uh, MN test email group would come directly to Amanda, Jeremy and myself. We've successfully used that already over the course of this project for a number of referrals. But so the position numbers, you know, do the go to the go to the link, go to the page, do the control F part and type in any one of these uh, numbers. Now you skip the space in the middle there. So it would be three, four, seven, one, six, eight, all as one number. I simply put a space in there so it stands out more clearly that it's simply the, the sequence there for you. But that's uh, that's the uh, the avenue to get in, in touch with us uh, in, in two different ways. Next slide, please. So on on what's following here, we're going to share some some details that essentially obviously uh, correlate directly to what is included in the position descriptions. But uh, I'm going to work on bringing that to life a little bit more and then I would certainly welcome uh, Beth and Chris's help to uh, to uh, to clarify that for you, but uh, clearly, you know, the epidemiologist is a very senior role, uh, very senior in terms of the responsibilities, the significance of the work, and so um, a lot of it, of course, you know, starts with a very broad scope. That whole position exists to you know minimize the morbid morbidity and mortality that's obviously uh, occurring in this COVID-19 pandemic. And so um, what the epidemiologist role is all about is to really conduct a very broad and complex range of investigations, of analysis, obviously all epidemiologic in nature. And so the context I would say to, to, to start with is to really think about this as an investigate investigations oriented role in this very broad context. There is a lot of um, focus obviously on data management, uh, reporting, investigation. So data analysis plays a very, very key role. Uh, collecting data, summarizing data, sharing data. Um, without the data, it's very difficult to, to conduct any meaningful uh, scientific activity. So um, broad scope, a lot of data analysis, a lot of investigations. And so it requires someone to work independently. Uh, that does not mean autonomously. Uh, you know, no one is going to do anything on their own <clears throat> without being uh, connected in with a lot of other people. Um, but, you know, candidates for this role really need to be able to to work with uh, limited uh, assistance and, and direct supervision every step of the way because they need to bring their experience um, and, and, and insights, you know, to the work that they're doing. Now, obviously, uh, that data work, that investigative work needs to lead to uh, developing recommendations uh, for healthcare providers, uh, the general public, and those then obviously need to be need to be shared, communicated. It's all about uh, it's all about solving solving problems uh, as quickly as possible from a uh, consistent, you know, using a consistent process along the way to arrive at those insights. And so uh, clearly cooperation uh, teamwork, a collaborative mindset is another very important aspect. Uh, working with patients, uh, you know, carriers, healthcare providers. That's why at the at the top of this uh, vignette, I really think of the broad context as a very important part of this particular role that somebody should be able to uh, to operate in. This is a senior role. Next slide, please. 
So we cannot list all of the requirements uh, for the role here. I will say um, it's been uh, great to partner with MDH on the position descriptions because we want to be very realistic about you know what's possible and what's not possible. You can uh, say in theory, you know, people need to have X, Y, Z background. Well, in reality, um, what candidates are out there that would be a fit for this project that can do the work, but do they meet all the requirements? So I think when you go to the full position description, you'll see what I believe is a realistic sliding scale, if you will, of you know uh, preferred. Um, you know, minimum requirements, obviously, and, and preferred uh, preferred requirements. So um, uh, strong background in epidemiology, public health is, of course, required, but uh, we're going to be uh, focused, obviously, on the candidates that meet as many or all of the preferred uh, skills as well. Beth, do you want to add some other points here to the conversation? You know, I think you did a great job. The one thing I was was going to mention was the the teamwork collaborative aspect of things, and you already you already hit on it and anticipated it. Um, you know, I would say, you know, just to reassure people, yes, we are looking for some, you know, this background and this experience, but to know that you would end up in a team environment and be supported um, moving forth. But there is a there really is kind of this base level of knowledge and expertise that would be needed to really be effective in that role. Thanks, Hans. Yep. Yeah, making use of the data. So with data, uh, data management background, database management, we're, we're putting that there under the preferred skills, statistical analysis, uh, experience in your background as a bridge. Uh, so here, of course, the bridges uh, in many cases from MDH to agencies, um, along with the concept of being in a bridging role, you know, clear experience and background in two way partnerships and collaboration. Uh, all of those things will be uh, will be of great interest to uh, to the state. OK, next next role. Next slide, please. Public health planner, so um, different focus. Um, I would say I would highlight here uh, probably the word long term. So uh, planning, facilitation, um, things that stand out to me are, are aspects of you know working at a region, working on regional level with planning groups. Uh, it's almost I would say uh, you know it's, it's obviously the title is public health planner. But I think it would be very fair to also look at this as a, having a lot of project manager like aspects in a sense that uh, there is a discovery that has to take place. Um, so there has to again be a lot of integration of data points, data analysis, um, figuring out um, you know, the evidence based and evidence informed strategies, but all in collaboration with a whole number of other partners and players to come to those insights, uh, then focusing on, and we list that under the second item here, uh, quality assurance and quality control um, methods um, that can be implemented and measured. Measurable results are very important. Very similar to a project manager is, of course, a very heavy emphasis on communication. Um, communication with people live, uh, hosting meetings, communication in all sorts of channels, uh, email, reports, uh, things of that nature, um, all play a role. This is a very relationship driven role, um, the way it's been defined by MDH, uh, involving regional coordination, uh, working with all sorts of different uh, healthcare professionals, cross agencies. So um, the role really uh, has many, many aspects of a project manager in a healthcare public planner uh, type environment. We can go to the qualifications. So similar to the epidemiologist role, uh, we again want to be as realistic as possible and, and essentially provide this uh, sliding scale concept. But um, clearly, you know, indications of having worked in the fashion that I just described 
uh, accomplishing quality control, quality assurance type um, uh, methods and, and, and implementations and measurable results. All of those things uh, are very key. You know, public policy and practices, having worked in maybe a smaller environment that would, you know, translate to what's happening here, uh, but that did have complexity, that does have, did have the public health aspects to it, regulatory aspects to it. All of those things are going to be very relevant to, uh, to being able to, to perform in this role. Beth? Thanks, Hans. Yeah, I think that, that your description of this in terms of the project management skills, as well as that bridging aspect, I think that the, the people filling the public health planner role will be needing to bridge not only across MDH, but with some of our external partners, such as local public health, tribal government, potentially some of our institutions of higher education, um, really thinking of it in part as a, as a liaison and, and potentially even a technical assistance support role. Um, there are a lot of moving pieces in this particular pandemic, and there's a lot of change it happens really frequently so being able to stay really on top of things and be able to be able to help communicate that change and form that bridging role is is really a lot of what we're looking for in this position beth uh, to me yeah. i'm, I'm going to ask you a question here to me yeah. the epidemiologist role the way it's defined and the public planner role have obviously a number of differences but also some parallels could you maybe contrast those for sure. our audience. Yeah, so um, when you think of the epidemiologist, they're going to be often your, your content expert about the disease itself, about disease transmission. They should have a really solid grounding in data and how to collect data properly and how to implement that properly. Um, there is, as you had mentioned, Hans, a strong kind of data analysis component, but really think of them as our subject matter experts in terms of COVID itself. The planner um, is, is going to be a slightly different, not to say that there isn't that knowledge level, but often the planner is the person who helps translate what is happening in the world of epidemiology at MDH into um, communications that are perhaps a little bit easier for some of our partners um, to, to take in and digest. And so they're really the ones kind of coordinating some of the operational roles and helping make sure that the communication is happening, making sure that um, any updates are getting out and about, looking at some of the quality metrics taking a look at you know, how well, for example, are the case interviews going or the contact follow-up interviews going, looking for opportunities for improvement. So, so really it's, there are some contrasts, but they do work together, I guess is what I'm getting at, is that we look at that as being a complementary working relationship. Does that help? Did that give a little more clarity? It does to me, yep. Okay. I, I really uh, think, and I don't want to oversimplify or diminish the significance and the complexity of the epidemiologist role in any way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. but to me, that role feels like it's very focused on bringing things together, you know, uh, in focus, data focus, mm -hmm. knowledge focus. Like you said, it's very content focused. Um, yes. Whereas the other role is, is, is still has a lot of you know data aspects to it, but then starts to turn around and is more externally oriented. It's making things actionable, making things manageable. That's why, in my mind, there is a very clear parallel to a project manager uh, yes. aspect in terms of keeping things on track, having clear plans, knowing what the milestones are, keeping everybody informed. So while both obviously have a very fundamental uh, foundation that's, that's, that's comparable and compatible, uh, the focuses of the positions in that sense to me are significantly different. Yes, I would agree with that, Hans. Yep. Okay, I well, hope that was helpful for yeah. our listeners. <laughs> Great. Uh, I thought that was important to just kind of have that pause there and that clarification because to me, 
as we now advance to the public health nurse role and the public health specialist role, we're really switching gears. Um, this is a very different type of a role, uh, has a frontline focus, I would say, uh, because it's assisting epidemiologists uh, and you know healthcare workers. It's working with people in the youth and sports camps, prisons, shelters, and group homes. That's that's a very different uh, kind of a you know context again is a word I would like to use here, um, and it, it it brings with it an advisory mindset. So I think I would I would again paint this as we're going from insights to actions with the prior two roles. Now we're going into a you know how do we make sure people understand this, follow the recommendations. They're still interviewing. There's still case management going in. Um, they're still looking at a lot of, you know, where the rubber meets the road data, but it is really a consultative role to people in these organizations and agencies. The, 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 the part of it may be also the general public, but a lot of consultation to uh, people in, in, in a healthcare delivery environment. Next slide, please. Um, you could simplify this a lot, but really having a very strong background in nursing, education wise, experience wise, clearly having, of course, the active license uh, as an RN uh, is very, very important. And then again, as we did with the other roles, there is sort of that scale in terms of the more experience, the closer uh, you know you are in terms of uh, significant public health focused experience is very key. Um, we have certainly had some situations when we were staffing the facility infection control um, nurse role that there are, of course, many candidates out there who are excellent in what I would describe as direct patient care. That is not the focus we're looking for here. Um, fantastic as that is, uh, you know, people with that background, really we're looking here for the uh, people who have worked on teams, who have worked in a public health background, um, who have worked with these types of problems, uh, infection control, infectious diseases, uh, all of those things are, are very uh, important in this environment. Beth, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think what I would add to that as well is, as you had noted, I think on the previous slide, you know, the, the um, audience is slightly different, but there, there is often very complicated or complex guidance that we are providing to many of these special settings. So I would use schools as an example. Um, this role would really be serving potentially schools and you may be dealing with people who are stressed or confused. It may not be the actual cases themselves, but it might be a school administrator, a principal or a teacher, or you know some of these decision makers who are really trying to navigate all of this guidance, make sense of it all. Um, so I think we are definitely looking for people who both would have a grasp of all of these complicated of this complicated information that can be again ever changing. So able to stay on top of all of that but really be able to have that patience and that ability to explain and help all of these different groups that we call up in our special teams, you know, really be able to help these different settings navigate what is going on in their world with regard to COVID at this time. So it's that patience, it's that ability to take difficult um, concepts potentially, translate that into more plain language and really, um, be directly interacting with different organizations to help them um, and, and realizing that many of them are going to be fairly stressed um, and and concerned about what is going on. So I don't know if that helps Hans, but yeah, that, that little... helps because all of those to me are again instances of the contrast I would want to paint here and that I, I refer to as a lot of the time when you think of nurses, the nurse role, it's the direct patient care. This, mm -hmm. this is very organizationally focused, team focused, um, meaning, you know, interacting with people in other organizations, working with them to solve their problems, to work with them, to counsel them, um, mm -hmm. all the things you just described. But so uh, it's really, yeah. I guess, I guess the word applied 
is a word yeah. that I would like. It's it's taking um, you know healthcare knowledge, nursing knowledge, facility infection uh, control knowledge, infectious disease processes and method knowledge, and applying it to the situations that need to be uh, supported, dealt with, with empathy, with care, with concern, with clarity of communication, uh, with you know uh, sharp eyes for details. Uh, all of those things are very important. Agreed. Let's move on to the public health specialist role. Um, in many cases, uh, there is, I would say, a parallel here to the case investigation role and the activities of that role. But the key difference that I would highlight here is that the audience is not just the general public, although it could, it could be a part of it, but it's really, it involves an extensive reach that involves physicians, nurses, uh, labs, hospital per personnel, um, uh, to engage with them. And again, we're, we're, we, we may start sounding a little bit repetitive here, but the whole problem solving focus, uh, having this sharp eye for details. So that's why in the position description here, reviewing data, looking at medical records, but then communicating uh, with different audiences and, and stakeholders in this whole healthcare continuum that uh, that's working so hard uh, on this on this pandemic. Uh, but then data management, again, uh, we saw that with the epidemiologist role, with these other roles, data, 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 data uh, plays a key role here. So data reviews, uh, following up, uh, accuracy, of course, all these aspects are, are very important. So there is, I think, a, a, a facilitating aspect to this particular position. It's not just interacting with, you know, one particular individual, you know, almost like a client service aspect. There is a facilitating aspect that is very partnership oriented, collaboration oriented, uh, because you got to work very closely with people in all these different areas that play a role in this total healthcare continuum. So um, I would I would highlight that as a key difference between a uh, normal uh, case investigation role and this role in terms of uh, the, the the much broader support. Uh, and involvement with these various uh, diverse audiences. So if in case investigation, uh, the focus was the general public, languages, understanding people, individual people's um, uh, specific situations so that the case investigation, you know, could be done accurately. Um, this, this is very much focused on a very broad audience. And again, want to highlight this again, data gathering and data management uh, to do this successfully and essentially also support all the other roles, the public health planner, the epidemiologist role with what those what those areas are, uh, you know, uh, all about and attempting to accomplish. Uh, it really dovetails that way. Next slide. So same thing, uh, sliding scale, looking for the strongest background in public health, uh, nursing, um, but really candidates need to have that uh, that experience in in working with partners, working across agencies, divisions, groups, um, organization wide uh, or you know intra organization uh, experience in terms of working on complex healthcare, public health, environmental health or nursing related uh, projects. All of these things would be would be very important and uh, to essentially refer again back to the data management skills. That's very, very, very key. Data plays such a key role and everything that is happening in this project, uh, that's that's definitely also a very key requirement. Beth? Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is for this particular role, um, the person may have to be ready to be somewhat flexible. You know, as things shift, um, you may find that you're working in kind of one area of, of what Hans has been describing as part of the response, and then we might need to shift focus partway through. Maybe you've been um, focused on schools and, and now um, we need your expertise in child care or corrections or, you know, some some other focus. So um, not that this would be a day by day ever changing piece, but that ability to be flexible um, and and shift focus um, could be important for this role. Very good. 
We have a couple of additional details uh, we'd like to also clarify. Uh, so the normal work schedule is essentially regular. Um, no evening work, no weekend work that is um, predefined. That is definitely, of course, the case for case investigation. The total team that that we are managing, uh, of course, there does have weekday schedules, weekend schedules, uh, calls happen, you know, up until a certain cutoff time in the evening. These jobs are, these positions are really more uh, traditional in terms of their schedule. Uh, due to the um, nature of the current uh, realities we're facing, uh, they are expected to be largely remote, uh, but due to the heavy need for collaboration, um, obviously uh, it's certainly entirely possible that uh, working on site in St. Paul at the MDH building can be an expectation for some number of these positions. I don't think it's necessarily specific to a role. It is more depending on individual people's focus and responsibilities as part of as part of these teams. If you basically picture a large org chart, which MDH of course has, it's going to have different areas with different specializations and these roles would essentially be embedded with those teams and Beth can maybe clarify here in a minute what the typical team size is in the MDH organization, but that's where these positions uh, will essentially be embedded and, and part of. So, um, you know, designated teams within the larger MDH organization. We've covered the requirements. Of course, education is very significant, a very significant component. Uh, we've talked about the experience and the more that is in the public health domain. Uh, with extensive experience that aligns with these uh, responsibilities. That's, of course, um, what we're looking for, um, ideally, and of course, also tied back to the, the potential requirement to work at times uh, locally on site in St. Paul. Uh, these positions, we will definitely have a preference for people who are Minnesota residents. A um, little bit different from the case investigation roles, multilingual skills still play a role and probably more in the public health nurse and public health specialist ones, less so with the epidemiologist and the planner ones. But of course, anytime multilingual, multilingual skills are always a plus. So I think that concludes the position overview, and I think I'll turn it back to, uh, to Liz here. Good, thank you. Um, Gail, yeah, we've had quite a few questions come in and I'll ask um, as many as I'm able to. Uh, just a few questions that I was thinking of, point of clarification. How many positions total do you anticipate hiring for this project? Um, Chris, would you like to answer that? I can certainly give the formal answer, but um, how would you answer that question? Sure, thanks Hans. Uh, yeah, we we don't have an exact number at this point, so it, uh, we're still um, planning for our longer term needs, but you know, we're starting with an idea of 10 each, something like that, and it may be more in some areas than others. So, you know, I, I would expect that for these four positions, you know, in the short term, somewhere around 40 and maybe even up to, I don't know, 100 might be um, an upper limit. Uh, in for the foreseeable future, but that's still a little bit to be, to be determined. Great, thank you. Yeah, that helps. And then how do, um, are there any benefits, you know, like health benefits or anything with these jobs? These are contracting positions and our uh, resource delivery associates and senior recruiters who manage these positions can certainly uh, share that. So there are benefits available. Um, but uh, things like healthcare benefits due to, frankly, insurance companies' expectations do not become available, uh, uh, you know, to be considered for, uh, for um, you know, some period of time. So please discuss that with the, with the recruiter and in detail uh, there. Um, but uh, due to the nature of contracting, the, 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 the total benefit picture is not the same as it would be uh, for a, an ongoing permanent position with a large company that way. Right, okay, so then are people paid with W-2s or with 1099s? These are all W-2 positions. Um, okay. None of them are 1099. These are not independent contractor positions. Um, 
we'll have to save that discussion for another day. There is a big <laughs> miscommunication in the general uh, world about what it means or what's required to be a legally um, correct uh, independent contractor. So uh, no, these are all direct W-2, Rose is the employer, the candidate is the contractor and the employee uh, position. Right, okay, and then, can you explain, you know, we hear so much about contact tracer. So what's the difference between a contact tracer job that other places hire for and a case investigator? I would like for Beth to uh, clarify that. Sure, I'd be happy to um, comment on that. So contact tracer is, a, I think, a catch-all term that we hear a lot um, in the news and in the press. Um, and it can mean many different things to many different people. Here in Minnesota, we um, put more of our focus on case investigators. So case investigators are the folks who call positive cases. So lab confirmed positive cases and conduct an entire interview with them to try to determine how they were infected, um, determine whom they may have been in contact with since being infectious, help them understand isolation, answer questions. It's really a, um, a conversation, I would say, between our investigators and the cases. Now, that often does, though, generate contacts. Um, those would be people who had been in within um, six feet of a confirmed positive case for 15 minutes or more. And those folks then are referred on for contact tracing. That is a slightly different um, interview. And, and in some cases, we refer them to our special teams. If they are healthcare workers or it's a long-term care facility or, or a school-related event where we do have um, more coordination and more advice. But in essence, the contact tracing is really simply informing someone that they have been exposed and advising them on quarantine. So it's a, um, you know, it can still be a difficult role to play because people obviously have not been informed necessarily that they have come in contact with a positive case and that they need to quarantine, but it's much less involved than a full case investigation. So I don't know if that helps clarify. Thank you. Thank you. And then um, last point of clarification, these are all full-time jobs. Are there any part-time positions? Well, the focus really is on full-time, but as we've also essentially uh, found with the prior roles we've supported thus far, if highly qualified people are available, but let's say for 32 hours a week, but not 40, uh, I believe they will certainly be considered as candidates um, because if they can contribute very meaningfully, but have you know have that cap on their on their schedule, uh, that's certainly something we will look at. It does get more complicated beyond that to integrate somebody you know in a highly fluid, uh, constantly changing environment, which of course this is. Um, so that would probably be my uh, my recommendation as far as that expectation. Right. And do you have, uh, well, I mean, this is a question for Chris. Do you have any sense of how long these positions will last? You know, is this through December or is this through next June? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm looking at the chat and maybe I can uh, elaborate a little bit too. Right now we have a funding through the end of December, well, December 12th, 30th. And we are very optimistic that these will be funded well beyond that because our need will go beyond that and so you know we're not guaranteeing anything beside beyond 12 30 because that's the way these things work with funding but um i like i said i think we will continue and so it could be you know a year it really depends on how the uh, pandemic evolves uh we we know that this is uncharted territory another question was whether they ever become state you know permanent positions you know they aren't necessarily a path to a permanent position however you know having some experience does help when applying for a permanent position so we would you know if we do need permanent positions in the long term for this kind of work we would just post them through our regular um you know our regular means and then if this you know if the, some of the candidates had background that would be helpful and i just wonder one more quick thing on we we these are all different than case investigation and contact tracers and we can we hire people that do both those things 
Uh, but there are still some positions through rows uh, for those, and those will also be changing. I'm not sure that we have an immediate need, but there may be some more needs, and I don't know if anyone mentioned that uh, in the past. Right. Um, what about the nature of the remote work? Does someone have to live in the Twin Cities, or can they live in one of the other cities, areas of Minnesota, and do this work from their home? They yeah. certainly... Go ahead. Hans, I can take that one. Yeah, um, they. This the nature of this work and, and most of our work at the health department is remote. Um, we do, um, so it can be anywhere in the state. We're trying to focus on hiring Minnesotans, um, and but it, it doesn't mean uh, you can work anywhere. It would be nice if you were able to come in uh, to St. Paul uh, for some training, uh, maybe occasionally, but it's certainly uh, not going to be required. Good, thank you. Um, and then, well, we can talk about this too, but uh, Hans, I just wanted to ask um, a couple of other, some of the people were asking about other jobs that aren't related to this project, but that was, might be hiring within Minnesota. Um, can you just give like a really brief just synopsis of what are some of the other options for people through ROSE, not for the Department of Health? Yeah, absolutely, and thanks for asking. So ROSE has been in the Twin Cities and in Minnesota since 2005. Our company was founded in St. Louis in 1993, but we started working with Target Corporation in 2005, and I'm very pleased to say that to this day, we are still a vendor there and we have a deep partnership uh, with them. Uh, if you heard the beginning of this conversation, I uh, discussed the uh, key projects we have been doing there and are doing there now. But we support a range of clients in the Twin Cities and also uh, companies, frankly, with a presence elsewhere, uh, headquartered on the East Coast or the West Coast that have a presence in uh, the state of Minnesota. So there were definitely some questions here on the website about these positions that we're talking about right now but you can go to the uh, general website and then uh, find jobs to uh, find our active list of positions. And there should be a whole range uh, of uh, openings uh, with large banks, with financial services institutions, with uh, uh, business to business clients uh, on a very regular basis. Right, and do you ever have openings for people who don't have bachelor's degrees? Oh yes, yep, all the time. Okay. Um, we, um, we really, Rose is a little bit uh, uh, like Amazon, maybe that's uh, not the, the best way to describe it, but Amazon, of course, does have the A to Z concept, so Rose International supports very high-level roles, similar to the ones that we're discussing here today, but we also support call center roles, light industrial positions, uh, admin clerical positions uh, of all kinds. That's always been kind of our um, approach. Uh, our clients basically want to work with us across the board. They're not interested in, you know, only a certain section for only certain skill sets. There's definitely many companies, especially on the IT side, that have a very high degree of specialization. We do not. We are a generalist in that regard. So um, anyone on here who um, is looking for, um, you know, a regular typical job that you've been in before, very good possibility you'll find um, those types of positions with Rose International. Maybe not today, but look look regularly because uh, I, I can certainly tell you, of course, uh, when when uh, COVID-19 started impacting, you know, economic activity back in March, April significantly, demand really went down significantly for, for new contracting positions. But you'd be surprised how active things have become. We are busier than ever. Uh, at this point, um, and I think it's simply because there is a lot of uncertainty of how things will evolve, and our clients uh, have become very, very active. So you you should find positions there um, every day. Um, I would just keep an eye on it. Great, thank you. And can you give us any uh, clue into the salary range for some of the positions with the Minnesota Department of Health? Well. Um, I, I, I frankly believe that because we're speaking about multiple positions here, that that's a little bit um, uh, awkward. Um, I would say that uh, that's certainly something that can be discussed right away uh, with our recruiters and senior recruiters uh, when you connect with them. 
Um, probably the most important thing is that you should know is that every position essentially has a very uh, defined uh, pay rate. So we're not in the business of, um, you know, trying to pay something to somebody but a different uh, amount to somebody else. We, we, we use a very standardized process. If you're a fit for the role and you meet the qualifications, then there is a very clear, you know, sort of uh, uh, economic picture that applies and um, our, our team is certainly happy to, uh, to discuss that with you in person. That's great, thank you. Um, before we wrap up, is there anything else, Hans or Beth, Chris, anything you want to um, mention? Well, I would, I would highlight as I added to the Q&A here that these positions are live. So if you do the normal, you know, control F on the uh, Rose Hot Jobs page, you can find them. Um, they are probably already a little bit further down the page because we support thousands of positions with clients across the country. So either use the position title or the number that I uh, indicated that was shared here earlier on the slides, but as one number or just the last three digits of it, you should find it. So they are live. They were posted on Friday in anticipation also of, uh, of this virtual job fair here. Uh, we stand ready to engage with uh, anyone who has an interest. Great. Thank you so much for being on the call today. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Chris, Hans, Jeremy, and Amanda. And Amanda and Jeremy were busy behind the scenes typing answers to all of you. Um, Thanks, Liz, I just for having us. And I just yeah. wanted to thank everyone for, for attending today and for their interest. Thanks. Good. You're welcome. Um, I do want to point out to everyone still on the call that the state of Minnesota as a hiring entity is still um, hiring. Uh, only the most critical jobs are posted, um, but you can go to mn.gov slash mmb slash careers. And this is a screenshot from two days ago or three days ago. Um, I just wanted to point out you can search by job family or by agency or by location or a couple of different things depending on your background. Um, so I do encourage you to go to the state careers and um, consider that in your job search. Uh, I, one, one thing very specifically uh, at DEED, our unemployment insurance department is hiring for a couple of more call center customer service representatives piece, people for our UI team. And so uh, that's open ended until they fill all of their openings. So consider that it's search ID number 41499. Those are definitely downtown St. Paul positions. Um, come back next Monday or this coming Monday, uh, October 5th. Next two weeks, we're going to be highlighting and celebrating Manufacturing Week in Minnesota. Um, Minnesota is blessed with so many different manufacturers of all different types of products. And they have positions not only on the production floor, but in engineering, in um, the administrative functions, in the sales and marketing functions. So um, no matter what your background or what kind of job you are looking for, I really highly encourage you to uh, jump on, pre-register, but jump on our virtual career fair um, on both Monday, October 5th and Monday, October 12th from 10.30 to 11.30. Um, and go to the Minnesota Manufacturing Week page on Deeds page to find out more information about that. As always, follow CareerForce MN on your favorite social media account. We have a fantastic communications team that is always getting out the latest information to job seekers, businesses, and state of Minnesota residents. So please follow CareerForce MN. And if you have any questions, last but not least, feel free to email me or contact the CareerForce help desk at careerforce at state.mn.us. We've got a fantastic team of colleagues who are helping everyone um, behind the scenes. So please get in touch. So thank you to everyone who's been on the call today. This has been a fantastic conversation with uh, Minnesota Department of Health and Rose International. And uh, stay in touch. Thanks. Bye-bye.